Okay, well, as you all know, the war continued to progress. Uh, and so we're now up to 1918. Uh, and um, soldiers are giving feedback uh, from the field regarding that awkward setup for the chin strap. Uh, shortages are becoming more prominent. And so they actually had what is called the model 1918. So just as all of the other belligerents in the war are making modifications and adjustments, so aren't the Germans. So here we have the model 1918 helmet. And here you have the same basic setup for the coal bucket. You have the same basic setup for the ventilation system. You have the same basic setup for the three uh, bolts that hold the liner together. But what is missing from the obverse of the helmet and will be prominently missing from the internal components of the helmet are the two dome studs that I made reference to on the model 1916 and the model 1917. And the interior, the studs are also missing. And that's because of the feedback that they got uh, from the field with the problems they were having with that liner uh, and chin strap setup, that they devised a new liner that had a D ring composition. Hoping you can see that. The D ring composition became part of the liner band. It no longer was part of the shell. And this, and they devised a new chin strap, and the new chin strap had a snap buckle at one end for easy on and easy off. And this was a vast improvement in terms of the um, soldier's reaction to being able to get the, uh, the chin strap on and off fairly quickly without it getting stuck and so on and so forth. Now what you've noticed on two of the three helmets that I've shown you is the chimp strap's missing. And that's because um, over the course of the 90 years since uh, they were produced, uh, the leather has usually disintegrated, been lost to time, and so of 100 World War I helmets that I encounter, you're lucky to find one with a chin strap. It's the one component as well as the liners have deteriorated. Uh, and when we get into you know, conservation and care and preservation, uh, a subject that's near and dear to uh, hearts, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay? But here you have a case of um, this liner happens to be in fairly good shape. Lots of times I find them without any liners at all. So there are the three basic models of the World War I Stahlhelm produced by Germany between the years of 1916-1918. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and that is, uh, it'll be a speculation on your part, but um, who's willing to venture a guess how many steel helmets were made between 1916 and 1945? So, all right, Dan. German helmets made by that country between 1916 and 1945. Take a guess. Uh, I'm going to go with 10 million. 10 million. Okay. All right, Sam, how about you? You were real close on the value of the... Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, 500,000. 500,000. Okay. All right. And uh, all right. Venture a guess. Come on. All right. Um, eight million. Eight million. Okay. And Robert? This isn't the price is right, you know. I mean, you, you, uh. remember, if you started off being a four or five, I'm hoping to get you to a six or seven by the end of the day. Okay. Robert, what do you think? I think somewhere around five million. Five million. Sounds like a lot of helmets, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Between 1916 and 1945, helmets manufactured by Germany or their allies by approximately 25 manufacturers, number close to 30 million. 
And today, I'm going to show you every one of them. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> yeah. And that's speculation, but it's pretty well documented they made approximately 22 million in World War II from 1933 to 1945 when they had five main manufacturers. In World War I, they had 24 manufacturers, including five that made uh, what's called the Austrian helmet, which I'm going to show you in just a minute. But before I get to that, I wanted to share with you the beginning of a segment that we'll talk about uh, after lunch, and that is camouflage. And so here we have a model 1916 German helmet, and it is, has all the characteristics of a model 16, including the leather liner band, the ventilation system that we've discussed, the three rivets, the three uh, leather uh, liner uh, pads on the interior, but it has something else. And that is because uh, it has been painted. It has been modified, adjusted, altered by the soldier. Because actually an order came out in June of 1918 that ordered the German soldier to paint his helmet. And the reason for that was to camouflage to mute, to adjust what the enemy was seeing. And if you think about the time frame, this is the summer offensive. You have all of your colors from the summer that are now involved. And so uh, the typical German soldier, uh, obeying his orders, whatever access he had to paint, decided to paint his helmet. And uh, camouflaging is an individual thing. You'll see many, many different schemes. Uh, this is what is referred to as a splotch pattern, or sometimes a patch pattern. Uh, and literally, uh, they would take the brush and uh, paint the certain colors, and they would take uh, another brush and they would paint the black stripes, or if you happen to notice the width of the stripes, they would dip their finger in the paint and they would paint it with their fingers. Now, if you notice, if we check the DNA, which I understand someplace along the line, uh, we're going to have access to doing uh, extra experimentation regarding the basic elements of a helmet. Uh, maybe someday we'll actually be able to get a DNA off that. So, But uh, this is uh, a camouflaged helmet from World War I. Remember, it's 1916. Wasn't done until 1918, but there were a lot of helmets at least 8 million of them, uh, that were produced uh, during that time frame. So I'm going to pass that around. Once again, personalized, has a soldier's name in it. Why does a soldier put his name in it? Mostly because he doesn't want somebody else to use his helmet. Okay, so this one happens to have initials, but uh, by all means, enjoy that. <laughs> 